40 years in the world. Okay, we're reading from chapter 5 of Joshua. I'll just break in in verse 6. It says, For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land, which the Lord sware unto their fathers, that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. And the children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were old. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word. Now, I want to just kind of give you a quick running outline. We're really thinking about consecration as our theme in this chapter as they come into the new land. Uh, there's a fresh consecration of themselves to divine service. And we'll notice in verses 1 through 8 that this takes the, the form of circumcision. And we'll think about the spiritual implications of that. But verses 1 through 8, circumcision. Verses 9 and 10 is commemoration. Uh, they celebrate the Passover. They remember, again, as God had called them for their, their marvelous deliverance from Egypt by the Passover lamb. So verse 9 and 10, there's commemoration. And then verse 11 and 12, there's consideration. And they're to consider something. And what they're to consider is they've got a new food now. Uh, prior to this day, they were eating the manna that came down from heaven. But now they're eating the old corn of the land. We want to think about the significance of this change of diet. And so we're going to be some consideration, verse 11 and 12, and then verses 13 through 15, we're going to be thinking about commander. It's really important at the start of this conquest of Canaan to learn who actually is the commander. Is it Joshua or is actually Joshua subject to another commander, the commander of the armies of the Lord of hosts? And so we'll think about the commander. So that's kind of our our theme this morning as we go through these things. Of course, there's going to be some spiritual application and some typical application. Spiritual application, we're going to be thinking about mortification of sin as we consider the issue of circumcision. We're going to think about the doctrine of mortification, self-judgment, death to self, uh, those very uncomfortable, unpainful topics that need to be discussed often. And then typical application we're going to be thinking about putting off the old man and saying goodbye to the reproach of Egypt and embracing a new identity in resurrection life. And so that's kind of the typical picture. But just let's begin by thinking about uh, this particular chapter. The Israelites were no sooner safe on the other side, Jordan, when God commands them to receive the sign of the covenant that he had made with them. That covenant uh, was a sign was circumcision. Now we go back to Genesis 17, and we'll see that it was a, clearly given as a sign of God's covenant with Abraham and his descendants. Uh, Genesis 17, verse 11, it says, You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And so basically... What's going on here in this circumcision is really a, as it were, a re kind of entering into the covenant relationship with God by taking this covenant sign of circumcision upon themselves. Collectively, as a nation, they had gone through the experience in a sense of death, typically by crossing Jordan. Remember uh, the stones on the bottom picturing death with Christ, stones on the other side being alive with Christ. So they've, they've experienced that pictorially. And now uh, through uh, scripture, circumcision is intended to be a, a picture of a, of a deeper spiritual truth. Um, the, uh, the, the Jews sadly missed the deeper picture so often. Uh, they 
they thought about the physical right and they put more importance on the physical right than on the spiritual truth which it was intended to convey. And so to, just to give you an example of that, I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 just for a minute, the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 10, just one verse, and that's verse 16. And of course, this idea is repeated throughout the Old Testament. Uh, even in Stephen's sermon, this idea comes out in Acts chapter 7. But in chapter 10 of, of Deuteronomy and verse 16, it says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. And the thought is this, that yes, this little minor surgical operation was a picture of something bigger. It was cutting off of the flesh. It was a putting away of the flesh. That was really the picture that was being conveyed. Putting off that which is sinful, putting off the, the old man, so to speak, uh, of the flesh, uh, being done with that and all that it speaks of. And sadly, uh, a lot of them had the, the, the physical procedure, but their hearts were largely unchanged. They weren't putting away uh, the flesh at all. Uh, this this putting off a small portion of the flesh was symbolic, really, of what they should be doing in a bigger scale, and that is putting to death uh, the deeds of the body, putting to death the flesh. And so I want to just think about what we call mortification just for a moment, that picture of putting to death just for a second from Scripture. Um, and we'll, we'll just look at a couple of Scriptures in Colossians. Kind of uh, last week, it was interesting. We were uh, doing some parallels with the book of Colossians, and we find ourselves there again today, and certainly there are some parallels. And again, we've got to remind ourselves that the New Testament writers, uh, they cut their teeth on the Old Testament, and they they understood that they, the thinking was so deeply affected by Old Testament truth that it kind of bleeds through the text. And so uh, Colossians 3, verse 3 says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid, with Christ in God. Then verse 5, as a result of that, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so the idea of mortification, the word mortify, uh, you go to a mortuary, right? That's where they keep dead people. And so it's the idea of putting to death depriving someone of their power, rendering them powerless. And so we're to do that to the deeds of the flesh. So having uh, said that, introductory thoughts, let's dive into the text in verse 1. It says, It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the, the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. And so this is really a, a fulfillment of what was stated back in Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. Joshua 1 verse 5, it says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. No man be able to stand before them. And so it, it literally says their hearts melted. What does that really mean? It says that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore. It means a complete loss of strength. And uh, their uh, their resistance is gone. In fact, naturally speaking, this would be the time to launch an attack, an all-out attack on the Canaanites and the Ammonites, because they're they, they have no fight in them. They they're just devastated by what they've witnessed. God drying up the Jordan, a nation crossing over, and it's had such an effect on them that they're actually powerless. And so, in a sense, as we're thinking naturally, now's your chance. Let's hit them now while they're in this condition. Let's exploit their fears. But God's ways are not our ways. And he doesn't work on 
the way of natural thinking. He doesn't work by natural means, neither is he in any hurry. In fact, there's a little bit of education required for the nation of Israel to prepare them for battle. Things have got to be put right. God wants things done decently and in order. They themselves are uncircumcised. We've got to deal with that. We don't want to miss the Passover celebration, which is, again, they remember they came the first month, the 10th day of the month. Well, coming up on the 14th day of the month is the Passover. We want to make sure that that is taken care of. And so there, there's business that needs to be taken care of before they can go and deal with the enemy. And so, in a sense, God can overcome the enemy at will whenever he wants. He wants his people, though, to share in the victory with him, to be co-laborers together with him. And he's as much concerned about the development of the worker as he is in the work itself. So he's got a work to do in them. And so we notice verse 2, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make the sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. It's interesting that um, it's just this circumcision is going to take place prior to the keeping of the Passover. I want you to go back with me just for a second to Exodus chapter 12, because it is interesting that the circumcision occurs prior to the keeping of the Passover. Exodus 12, verse 48, when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof you see that no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof so in other words to participate in the remembrance feast of the passover circumcision was an essential requirement you couldn't remember the passover unless you were circumcised and so now we're going to see this passover feast and there has to be a, a mass circumcision in fact joshua made him sharp knives verse three and circumcised the children of israel at the hill of the foreskins now it's not saying the hill was made up of foreskins but there were so many people circumcised actually a whole generation of males probably two-thirds of the nation at this moment circumcised that they called the place where, where it took place the hill of the four skins. Now, think about this. How vulnerable Israel were now to attack by their enemies. They've just basically circumcised their entire army. And if you remember back in Genesis 34, you can see a definite vulnerability in connection with having been circumcised. And it's the story of the men of Shechem. And, and you know the story well, I'm sure you do. But just notice in chapter 34 of Genesis and verse 25, it says, and it came to pass on the third day when they were sore. Apparently it's a painful operation that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. Isn't that amazing? Just two individuals, Simeon and Levi, were able to destroy all the men of Shechem because they were on their third day after being circumcised, and they were sore. Now the whole nation of Israel are in that condition. Talk about being in a vulnerable place. But the interesting thing is that at this point, the Israelites feared the Lord more than they feared the enemy and they wanted to do things right oh what a difference it makes when we're like that when we want to when we fear the lord we want to do things right more than we care about the enemy and what he wants to do or threatens to do and so um he does uh, the lord also does things to us sometimes in our lives that make us very 
dependent on him rather than our own strength. <laughs> we may not understand it at the time, but sometimes the Lord adds a, brings a sharp knife and starts cutting away at us and makes us weak so that we'll depend on him. And oh, how we need to be people that depend on the Lord. So we are circumcised spiritually through the death of Christ. Just let's look at this again. Find ourselves back in Colossians, spiritual application. Colossians 2, 11, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. And so we're circumcised by the death of Christ. It's in a sense, when we came to share in Christ's death, right? Remember, uh, he died for us, but we also died with him. It was a cutting off of that old life, that old man, all we were in Adam, that's, that's, that's crucified with Christ. It's cut off. So we're circumcised with the death of Christ. Now we're not to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. God has sentenced our flesh to death. And on a daily basis, we need to make this truth a reality, uh, in a sense, by applying the sharp knife of self-judgment to ourselves. Circumcision is painful. And judging ourselves, uh, self-judgment, is painful at times. We just get, we sometimes we just got to get honest with God about our condition and be real in his presence. You know, it is interesting that one of the things it tells us in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one 31, concerning self-judgment, it says, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And the thought is this, that if there was more self-judgment if there was more uh, applying, as it were, the knife, mortification, putting to death the deeds of the body in our own lives, there would be less need of divine chastening in our lives. And so certainly for the Corinthians, they had experienced chastening because, because of a lack of self-judgment. If you remember, many of them were weak and sickly. Some of them were asleep. And again, it was because of a lack of self-judgment. And so, again, there's a need for that I might ask the question, have we used the knife this week? Have we, have we as it were, uh, mortified uh, the flesh at all this week, put to, to death the deeds of the flesh? Now, again, we don't want to be morbidly preoccupied with self. We want to be taken up with Christ. There's a, there's a danger of going overboard. But at the same time, I think we're, we're not in danger of that. Our danger is a failure to really get serious about applying the sharp knife of self-judgment so that we are not judged by the Lord. So anyway, they uh, go ahead and they do this circumcision. And it says in verse four, four, and this is the cause. Why does a whole nation need to be circumcised at one go? Why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males? And all men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. So that, so that generation were circumcised, but they failed. And again, because they were, in a sense, they were in rebellion and in unbelief, weren't they? This is the generation that wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years and died in the desert. And so they're hardly covenant-keeping, believing saints at this point. Uh, they, they they believed the, the, the report of the the 10 spies rather than the two spies. They, they were crippled by unbelief. They couldn't enter in because of unbelief. And so because of their frail condition, they didn't circumcise their offspring. They're supposed to do it on the eighth day. They were supposed to do it, but they failed. The whole generation was neglected. And it's almost like the Lord caused them, in a sense, to completely suspend the covenant until that generation died in the desert. Literally, God gave them up to years of wanderings. And as a result of that, they failed to circumcise their own offspring because they just weren't taken up with spiritual things. So it says, 
in verse 6, for the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. And the children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. So isn't that remarkable that during the wilderness, those 40 years, there was not a single child that was circumcised. And, and so they, they just, it's almost like all spiritual reality was suspended because they were so crippled by unbelief and divine chastening. And so we notice now in verse eight, it came to pass when they had, done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. So there has to be a, a kind of a healing process. There's no no point trying to attack the enemy, all the rest of it. There's this time for the soreness to, to die down, to, to, to feel well again. So that kind of ends the first section on circumcision. But we could say this, there can be no conquest of the enemy without death to self. If we don't put the knife to self, we will never get victory over the enemy. We will never defeat our enemies. In a sense, there must be this willingness to identify with Christ in death, that death, the old man cut off with Christ and then embrace the resurrection life if we're going to walk in victory. Before the Israelites could get victory over the enemy, they had to experience victory over sin and self themselves. Now, verse 10. It says, sorry, verse 9. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from, from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Gilgal caused meaning rolling. But this thought of um, the reproach of Egypt being taken away you could see the egyptians you know they saw the israelites go they knew that they were headed to a promised land and for 40 years they just went around in circles and died in the desert and so there was a, probably a lot of reproach you see this this people they they, they they didn't even they didn't get what they wanted they didn't even get into the land and now that reproach of their failure has taken away. They're now in the land. They're back in covenant relationship with the Lord. And in a sense, the Egyptian mentality has gone. The reproach of Egypt has been rolled away. So verse 10, the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jordan. So now this time of commemoration, keeping the Passover. And again, notice that connection with circumcision. Some people have said that circumcision followed by Passover are the most unmilitary acts ever recorded in a conquest of a land. <laughs> in a sense, it's all spiritual, isn't it? They're, they're getting spiritual things right before they attempt the conquest. God is calling them back to the basics of their relationship with him. And maybe that's what the Lord's doing to some of us, calling us back to the basics of our relationship with him, putting off the, the deeds of the flesh, getting serious about applying the knife, mortification of sin, and then the remembrance of Christ in his death. It's all about death, isn't it? Remembrance of his death and death to self. And of course, enjoyment of resurrection life. These are the things that God is calling us back to through the book of Joshua. So again, we're saying that this that circumcision was a requirement for the keeping of the Passover. And spiritual revival always unveils the cross in a new and fresh way to the saints of God. Uh, whether it's bringing out the cross and the glories of his work for us there on Calvary, 
uh, in in his redemptive work, whether it's bringing to us again that work of his death, for, uh, our death with him uh, in Romans six and the grasping of that. These are truths that always are connected with revival. Well, verse 11, it says they did also eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. So what does this speak of? All of a sudden, verse 12, it says the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn. So now there's an exchange of diet. Prior to this was the, the manna, the bread which came down from heaven. Now it's the old corn of the land. Now, again, I want to think about the difference between manna and corn. So the manna comes down from heaven. It's really a picture of Christ in incarnation, isn't it? He said, I am the true bread which came down from heaven. And so the manna was really a picture of Christ in his incarnation. He is that true bread. Uh, John chapter 6 brings that out uh, very clearly. Uh, and, and so he's that bread that came down from heaven. But what about the old corn of the land? Well, of course, to get that old corn, there had to be, first of all, a corn of wheat had to be sown in the ground and it had to die before that corn of the land could come out. And of course, we, we know the passage we're thinking of, John chapter 12, and verse 24, John 12, verse 24, where it says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth the Lord. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. And so what we could say is this, that there, there's a, a change in diet because, again, typically now what we're saying is for ourselves, we're not so much occupied with Christ in his earthly incarnation. Now we're connected with the one who died and has risen again. We're connected with the risen man. In fact, the church is connected with the risen man. And, and so uh, that's where the, 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 this old corner of the land comes in. Just, just look for a moment at a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 16. Just a very interesting scripture. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, which brings out this truth. Second Corinthians 5, verse 16, it says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. That's the manner. Yet now henceforth know we him no more. What do we know now? We know, we know a different Christ, right? We know a Christ who is risen and glorified. And we're connected now with that risen, glorified man. And so that's our new food now, gazing on the Lord in glory. It's interesting that in the hymn book that we use at the Remembrance Meeting, uh, in our assemblies uh, in, in the States, we use a hymn book called Hymns of Worship and Remembrance. And one of the guys who helped put this book together was a South African servant of the Lord called A.P. Gibbs. And quite a number of the hymns, he can't stand to see Christ left on the cross. And so what he'll do is he'll write, and this takes a lot of skill, to write an extra verse of an existing hymn to fit perfectly. And yet that extra verse, and he's done it on several of them, what he wants to do is get Christ off the cross and and risen and glorified at the father's right hand and he does a masterful job and the thought is that the old corn coming out of ground rising up is a picture of knowing christ in resurrection our new food we feed on him who has risen and is seated in majesty on high and so a new diet something to consider and then the final section is a new commander. It says, verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. 
And Joshua went unto him and said to him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? So you've got to remind ourselves here. At this stage, Joshua would be 80 years of age. Remember, he spent 40 years in the wilderness. <laughs> so he's 80 years of age. And he walks up to this armed man and says, Whose side do you want? Are you for us or against us? What, what amazing courage Joshua had. And of course, it's, it's, it's a great question he's asking. Are you for us or against us? And it's good to ask that in terms of, the Lord says that, right? Are you for me or are you against me? If you're not for me, you're against me. What about the word of God? Are we for it or are we against it? We need to choose sides. That's what he's really saying is whose side do you want? Choose sides. We have that mentality in the battle, choosing sides. We, whose side are we on? Are we fighting for the Lord on his cause? And so notice that the answer, verse 14, he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said to him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? So this captain introduced himself really as the captain of the host of the Lord. He's the commander in chief of the host, the armies of heaven. This is the battle title of the Lord. He's the Lord of hosts. Uh, if you look back to First Samuel, and we'll just read this. I'll look forward to First Samuel 17, verse 45. It's really the battle title of the Lord of hosts. It says, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And so definitely uh, the Lord is, is coming to them, as it were, as the captain of the Lord of hosts. He's the, he's the charge of the, the armies uh, of, of, of the host of heaven. And so he says, uh, as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And notice that um, uh, what Joshua does. It says, when, when he hears this, it says, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship he recognized that he was in the presence of one who was greater than him one who was divine this angel of the lord or we would say an old testament christophany or theophany but more accurately a christophany it's an appearance of the pre-incarnate son of god and the fact that he receives worship supports this that he is a divine person joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him what saith my lord unto his servant didn't it remind you a little bit of saul of tarsus he falls flat on the earth when he sees the lord in glory remember he sees a vision of the glorified lord and the first thing he says is what will you have me to do and here we have the same thing. Joshua says, what saith my Lord to his servant? What instructions? What directions? If I'm acknowledging, I'm handing over. You're the captain now. You give the, you give the instructions. I'll do what you ask me to do. What do you have to say? And we all should have that, that same attitude in the presence of the Lord. Asking him for direction. What would you have me to do? Are we conscious that the same person, this magnificent Christophany, actually lives within us by his Holy Spirit? <laughs> Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation this Christ liveth in me. This is truth. And are we saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? There can be no victory for the Lord in public unless there's worship of the Lord in private. Here, Joshua is found as a worshiper. Let's just kind of summarize what Joshua understood and that we need to understand. Notice verse 15. The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, 
Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Remember when Moses saw this burning bush in the desert and he told, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. So like Joshua, we need to understand three things from this. One, Christ's holiness. Take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. It's kind of interesting. When I was preaching in India, in South India, um, all of the assemblies there, they they leave their shoes at the door. <laughs> and uh, they all wear flip-flops. How they find the right pair of flip-flops afterwards, I have no idea. Thankfully, I had Crocs, so I was able to pick them out. But it was the first time in my life I'd ever preached barefoot. But uh, you go in the assembly, they took their shoes off. And, and I know it's just a symbolic thing, but what they're recognizing is get your shoes off because he is holy. You're on holy ground. He's here. You're on holy ground. And then Christ's leadership. Joshua acknowledges his leadership. What saith my Lord unto his servant? Are we acknowledging his leadership in our lives and saying to him, what? saith my Lord unto his servant. And then Christ's worthiness by worshiping him. And of course, it says Joshua fell down and worshiped him. So this is a marvelous chapter, very practical, circumcision. Are we applying the knife, the sharp knife, putting off the deeds of the flesh? Commemoration. Do we value that time of commemoration? But we come together and we call to remembrance what the Lord has done for us, redeeming us by precious blood. Consideration. Do we are we more consumed with the manner, Christ in incarnation, or are we recognizing our connection with the risen man? That's who we're really connected with now, the one who died but has risen again. And he's the glorified risen head of the church. That's our connection now. We're part of that heavenly people. And sometimes I think we miss that. And then acknowledging, as we've said, that he is ultimately the commander. And we bow in his presence. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the sweet time we've had in this chapter. Pray that it might have been helpful to thy people there. In Malaysia, we pray your blessing on them, their labors for thee. We thank thee for them and every remembrance of them. Uh, we pray again for their testimony to shine brightly in these dark days. Encourage them, Lord, we pray. Bless them. And Lord, pray for all of us that we would be more consecrated unto the Lord Jesus Christ, for he surely is worthy. In his own precious name, we bring these thoughts. Amen.